please tell us your name uh, and really what you've been up to and, and, and uh, how you came here. I'm Alan Goldhammer. I'm the director of the True North Health Center in Santa Rosa, California. San, uh, True North Health is a residential care facility that specializes in medically supervised water-only fasting. And we're affiliated with the True North Health Foundation, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is public education and research. We have a website, fasting.org, which is a new fasting compendium website where all the information and research that we're doing and others is located. It's freely available to the public, www.fasting.org. What are the benefits of water fasting? Well, water fasting is a really unique biological adaptation that gives the body a chance to do what it does best, and that's heal itself. So many of the conditions that people are suffering from today, from obesity and high blood pressure, diabetes, autoimmune diseases, lymphoma, and others, are caused essentially by dietary excess, the excess consumption of fat and protein and processed foods that lead to these conditions. And fasting is a way of giving the body a chance to mobilize and eliminate the consequences of many of these processes, and it does it very rapidly. What are the negatives to water fasting? Well, unfortunately, there's two types of water fasting. One is intermittent fasting where you narrow the feeding window. People, maybe they don't eat breakfast before a certain time and dinner after a certain time. And in doing that, they give themselves 14 or 16 hours of fasting every day. And the, the thought is that the accumulation of these brief periods of fasting may have biological benefit in helping people control dietary excess and institute improved autophagy or other factors associated with improving their health. Another version of fasting is long-term medically supervised water-only fasting, and that's what we do at the True North Health Center, where people are going from 5 to 40 days on water-only, but in a controlled setting. And there you have to make sure that the history exam and laboratories support the use of fasting, so the appropriate patient is fasting. They're monitored twice a day so that we ensure that it's done safely and effectively. Medications have to be appropriately withdrawn prior to initiating fasting. People have to be in a resting state so they don't end up depleting protein reserves but rather burning their fat stores. And so if it's done properly, it can be done safely and effectively, but it does need to be done in a controlled setting. And that's the downside to long-term water-only fasting. Should everyone fast? How often should people fast? And how long should each fast last? So everybody does fast. They fast from the time they eat dinner until they break their fast with breakfast in the morning. Uh, the debate is about how long should that period of fasting be. We advocate uh, a 16-hour period of fasting as a routine basis for people. For people with higher caloric needs, perhaps maybe you narrow that to 14 hours of fasting. But the point is that is something that is thought to be beneficial for all people and not just have them eating around the clock, especially late at night right before they go to sleep. There's detrimental considerations about that type of food consumption. Uh, and then the idea is that people may benefit from periodic longer-term fasting. And that the research is still being done. We're doing some of that at the True North Health Center in conjunction with the True North Health Foundation. And so we're looking at changes in biomarkers and trying to determine really what's the ideal amount of time that a person would uh, fast for a given condition and also for health promotion. I think ultimately we're going to find that people that use short-term fasting, that five to ten day fasting preventatively, may actually be some of the people that gain the greatest benefit of all. What health challenges does water fasting work for and which does it not work for? The, the conditions that fasting works the best for are conditions that are caused or contributed to by dietary excess. So obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, autoimmune diseases, lymphoma, these conditions that are tied to poor dietary choices seem to benefit the most from fasting, which makes sense because the body is able to mobilize and eliminate these accumulated products of metabolism and exogenous toxic products in a rapid way. Conditions that uh, involve depletion or people don't have adequate kidney function or ability to adapt to the fasting state, like type 1 diabetes, would be relative contraindications. And so we avoid using fasting in people that are not going to have a good result. Does fasting get rid of pathogenic bacteria in your gut? Well, that's a very uh, a question of uh, interest in active research. In fact, we've completed a study with Luigi Fontana from Washington University looking specifically at this issue of what happens to the types of bacteria that live in the gut and what happens to their byproducts. Uh, and so I don't have a definitive answer to those changes, but what we see clinically is a lot of conditions associated with gut problems seem to improve, ranging from ulcerative colitis to Crohn's on down. These patients do get better clinically when you use fasting in conjunction with a whole plant food SOS-free diet. 
uh, exactly how they're getting better, why they're getting better, is something that we're hoping to be able to discover with our ongoing research. Does fasting get rid of Lyme disease? That's a very good uh, question. Lyme disease is a complicated question because many people that are told they have Lyme disease are actually dealing with the consequences of previous Lyme exposure and or its treatment. Anybody that's been put on long-term antibiotics for extended periods of time often develops a sequelae that uh, can be thought of as you know, part of the overall syndrome, but not necessarily active Lyme disease itself. So if a person has acute Lyme disease, we recommend the appropriate use of antibiotics, actually. Uh, for chronic Lyme disease, where the acute Lyme disease may have been treated, but the residual symptoms persist, these are often patients that actually are manifesting autoimmune disease. And the autoimmune disease, including um, problems with post-treatment residuals from Lyme, often do respond well to fasting and diet and lifestyle change, but it can be a very challenging and difficult condition. And I don't think it's exactly black and white about which symptoms are caused by which problem. For example, antibiotics have an immunosuppressive effect. And so if you take antibiotics and you feel better, that doesn't necessarily mean it's killing off you know, uh, active infection. It may be because it's suppressing the immune response, it's reacting in autoimmune disease. So it can get very challenging and difficult uh, determining you know, which course of treatment is appropriate and, and which responses you're seeing are due to which effect. And I don't think the research there has even really begun. If fasting is so effective, why doesn't the FDA and medical industry embrace it? Well, it's interesting. Fasting at one point was considered criminal quackery, and more recently it's been considered more cutting-edge research just because there has been more research coming out. I think it's mostly upon people like us that are doing and utilizing this therapy to publish real data in reliable sources, demonstrating both its safety and its efficacy. Now, we have taken a major step in that direction. We published the first fasting safety study. Uh, people can view that on our website, healthpromoting.com. And that, um, that study carefully looked at five years of consecutive fasting patients and their adverse events and consequences. And the conclusion was that fasting is safe when it's done according to protocol. And so now we have that published in peer-reviewed journals. And as a consequence, human subjects committee are willing to approve uh, appropriate studies that follow the protocol that we use at the True North Health Center. You guys are the pioneers this time in history, that this hasn't been pioneered before. Well, I think it has been pioneered before. It's just that we're fortunate to be at a time, and we're fortunate to have collected a group of skilled individuals that have the capacity to conduct scientific studies and actually publish credible data. I think a lot of times in the past you had really um, energetic doctors that were very much clinicians. And so their focus was just trying to stay out of jail and do the therapy and, and get people well. Um, we came along with a team where we have clinicians, but we also have researchers. And working together, we've been able to kind of do, you know, their strengths and weaknesses of, of each. And researchers don't make good clinicians. Clinicians oftentimes don't make good researchers. But by putting uh, all of us together as a team, we've been able to both accomplish the clinical benefit as well as being able to document it in a way that's actually publishable. We've published several case reports here recently in the British Medical Journal, which is a ma major impact journal. And it's had a, 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 it's a tremendous excitement amongst people that, you know, because they're not used to seeing a uh, whole plant food diet and fasting and these types of things being effectively used at very serious conditions like lymphoma and like polypharmacy complications. And so, you know, the fact that one, we're able to do it, but two, they're willing to publish it is, I think, a very exciting uh, indication that maybe things will start to improve. Does fasting prevent wrinkles and does it get rid of wrinkles? Yeah, actually, I don't think fasting prevents uh, short-term wrinkles because when you lose weight, sometimes wrinkling actually becomes even more apparent. Uh, it takes this body a while and the skin a while to adapt. So initially, after fasting, sometimes people know an notice an accentuation of wrinkles. Over the long run, though, wrinkles are essentially a, a source of free radicals. So you get uh, free radicals interacting with collagen tissue and causing cross-linkaging. So I think what you can do is try to slow the aging process down by getting people to live healthily, whether that's fasting or diet, lifestyle, exercise, et cetera. I think there'll be a slower tendency towards aging as a consequence of healthy living. Whereas something like smoking, where you bathe the body in free radicals, is that's what causes smokers' face, is because people get a rapid aging process. And of course, it's not just the face, it's the whole body, including the inside of the vessels, which is why 80% of smokers never get lung cancer, because they die from heart disease before they live long enough to grow their tumors. Does water fasting help prevent dementia? Well, that's a good question. We know that increased uh, circular, 
circulating levels of BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, is associated with lower risk of uh, dementia in at least rats. And that rats uh, in cages that are given the opportunity to exercise have much higher BDNF and much lower dementia rates. It turns out that fasting also increases BDNF levels. In fact, if you look at the biomarkers associated with exercise benefit, oftentimes they mirror the same biomarker changes in fasting. And I believe that what may be going on there is that what you're measuring is um, factors that reverse the consequences of dietary excess. So both exercise and fasting help uh, reverse the consequences of dietary excess, and one of those may be increasing levels of these biomarkers like BDNF that are thought to be associated with a lower risk factor for dementia. How long do the benefits of fasting last? Well, the benefits of fasting are directly tied to the diet and lifestyle changes that occur as a consequence of fasting. So if you adopt a health-promoting whole plant food, SOS-free diet, engage in regular exercise and get appropriate sleep, you're likely to see not only continuation of the benefit, but an accentuation of those benefits. A lot of the detoxifying enzyme pathways may be uh, cumulative. They may accumulate. So um, again, specific scientific answers will be coming with the research that we're doing. What we see clinically is that it appears that every time people fast, there's an accentuating benefit. It gets easier to fast, there's a reduced total body load, but all of it's going to be de dependent on healthful living. Health results from healthful living. Healthful living involves diet, sleep, and exercise. People that want to get healthy have to pay the price, and the price of health is, of health is healthful living.